saved my gushing for right now. Um, but I wanted to say that uh, when I was a 17-year-old weirdo in uh, suburban Kentucky, um, seeing the movie of Slaves of New York let me know that I wasn't alone and that it was going to be okay and that people like you who are out in the world and um, you are a lot to do with why I live in this fantastic city and so my 44 year old self thanks you so much for that and I imagine a lot of people in this room can relate to that. <laughs> And uh, we're even more fortunate now that you have written this incredible memoir. Um, so can you talk a little bit about what made you decide to do this? Um, well, thanks. And also thanks for um, agreeing to host this. And thank you all for, for coming. And uh, let me know if you can't hear me. I'll just stand up and shout. Um, gosh, you know, my mom, um, I was living in New York for all this time. And I was living in, uh, I went to college in New York City in the 70s. I went to Barnard. And boy, the city was so different then. And it was uh, just under severe bankruptcy. And it was super dangerous. It was a time of the panic in Needle Park. And it was one rough place. And I was a kid. And I had grown up in Western Massachusetts. And um, uh, the parents, all the parents in Western Massachusetts, turned the heat off because there was some kind of oil crisis. But my grandparents lived in, um, hey, honey, uh, my grandparents lived in um, Flushing, Queens, so we'd go and see them once or twice a year. And they had a super overheated apartment. And I always thought, wow, when I grow up, I'm going to move to New York so I can be warm. <laughs> and so I was determined to get to this city somehow. So I went to Barnard and uh, it was a strange place to go to college. It didn't have like a real uh, campus or anything. And uh, um, it was for pretty sophisticated girls. Most of them were commuting from their apartments and there was only a few dormitories. But I hung out in New York City and then um, I left for a couple of years and when I came back it was the early 80s which was quite um, a seminal time in New York City. And um, then um, my life went by and when it was almost over I, uh, my mother <laughs> got sick so I um, moved to uh, Ithaca, New York, where she had been a professor. And um, uh, she had retired one year before that at age 80. And I thought I could just go and fix up things and um, get some home health care in there and everything. But what happened was she got worse, so I had to stay up there. And my kids said, I'm fed up with Brooklyn. So she came up to um, uh, go to high school up there. And this was 2011. And I ended up just staying. And um, then I had to put my mom in nursing homes and I couldn't, um, uh, I couldn't leave her and I just stayed up there and I moved to a more even rural area and I, I lost interest in the city. Like I never thought that would happen to me but I was no longer enjoying the city. I was no longer into the latest restaurants and the galleries and the galas and the Mm, museums and whatever was going on musically and before my love had been just to ride the subway and look at people and walk I walked every neighborhood in Brooklyn and all of a sudden I just was no longer getting the joy or material from the city that I once had so I'm staying there for the time being and I'm in Schuyler County which is like the mo one of the most depressed counties of all of New York State and the people up there I felt like um, it was like a year in Provence, but without truffles, <laughs> gourmet peasant food, indigenous music, architecture. Uh, the only thing I was left with up there was a recipe for the famous one dish of um, Schuyler County, which is called macaroni salad. Now, I want to share this recipe with you. Take your box of macaroni, one pound box, Cook it for about, well, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes. Okay, take a jar, a big jar, of Miracle Whip salad dressing and uh, maybe about a salt shaker of salt. <laughs> Combine the ingredients and uh, you could chill it, room temperature, however you like. And I, I mean, this is like part of my book. This is just like, oh my God, I found this rare part of the United States of America. Maybe it's not so rare, but believe me, it was just as intriguing to me as the New York City of the early 80s had been with the art galleries and the kids. And in those days, like the early 80s, I had no money. 
take a bus, I was that poor, take a bus down at night because the subways were too dangerous, get off in Soho, it was still like working factories and they were making pins, needles, buttons. The bottom floors were just empty spaces. See a crowd of kids on the street, 1983, whatever. What's going on? Well, there's an art opening. Uh, okay, I'll see what this is about. Nobody was like, you can't, you can't come in here. Go in there. Well, what are these paintings? Well, this guy used to, um, he's a janitor here. He's a janitor at this art gallery. He uh, likes to paint his stuff on subways. Oh, okay. Give you a glass of really cheap, warm white wine. It's Keith Haring. He's got to show up at Shafrazi's. <laughs> so, I mean, I like explored that city of that time and era, and I was just, um, gee, I'll write this down at night, and and that was the city for me of my of my youth. <laughs> Do you think there's still an opportunity for people to be surprising and weird and make art in New York, or is that era over? Is there still possibility for that to happen? I have no clue about the New York of today. I'm, I'm just amazed. I come back and I'm like uh, Rip Van Winkle or something. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I'm, I'm staying at this hotel over in the Lower East Side. What happened to the Hispanic people? What happened to the African American people? This is all like young white hipsters. I mean, they're all like, they're waiting online to use the, um, the rooftop lounge at the hotel that I'm staying at for these like $20 drinks. I don't know what's happened to the city. I just know for me, there's probably somebody out there that could find interest or material in it. I just, I just, I just lost interest. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about um, isolation because you're pretty far upstate and you spend a lot of time, you know, with animals on a lot of land and there's both comfort and upset in that. Can you talk a little bit about what that does to your soul, being by yourself like that? Not really. No, I can't. I can't. I just know, like, when I wrote these memoirs, I could put in anything I, I wanted, you know? And so I put in some stuff about going to the supermarket up there, and I put in a lot, be forewarned, about a shrub. <laughs> <laughs> and recently I got a really nasty review for this memoir because I wrote a whole chapter about a shrub. <laughs> now, let me tell you, the reviewer said, a memoir is not about a shrub. <laughs> a memoir is an uplifting, illuminating look into a person's life and background. And I'm like, yo, nobody told me the rules for memoirs. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, I got the shrub in there. Like, what are you, anti-nature? My neighbor was trying to chop down my shrub. I didn't know who was trying to hurt the shrub, so I, I tried to help my shrub. I, I, I protected my shrub. I put caution tape around the shrub. The shrub was sticking out over the sidewalk. The neighbor came, and I didn't know it was the neighbor. I swear to God. Did not know who was doing this. I figured it was like a drunk student that was angry at my shrub. I planted the shrub. It was at my mom's house. My mom's in the nursing home. Don't mess with my shrub. Yeah, it's sticking out over the sidewalk, but it's allowed to. It's a private road. <sighs> okay, I'm trying to collect it. <laughs> So, basically, I had to keep doing more and more things to protect my shrub. And as the person, didn't know who it was, kept breaking off branches of my shrub, which was going to bloom in June. Okay, it was February. It was going to go on for another six months. Don't break my shrub down. So, I tried to do different things, but they kept hurting my shrub. And I put up cones around the shrub, and I found them thrown away. And then I thought, well... They're using their hands to break off my shrub, so I put stuff on the shrub, like deer repellent. Deer repellent smells like urine. I figured if it was a student, they were gonna break my shrub off and then go to classes. And then they were gonna smell like deer repellent, but that didn't help, so I put on some hot sauce and some maple syrup and a few other things, but they still kept breaking the branches off my shrub. Anyway, finally the neighbor sent me an angry letter about my shrub and said like, he sent, had his lawyer send me a letter saying like, no shrub is allowed to go into the pedestrian walkway and the, I'm a lawyer for your neighbor and if you do not do something about this shrub you're under a lawsuit. That's when I decided like get me out of Ithaca. Ithaca is an academic you know um, they have health food stores it's 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 intellectual community get me out of this place. So that's when I moved to Schuyler County but the point is I don't know what the I don't know what the point is. The point is, if I want to write a memoir and keep my shrub in it, and it's not going to be necessarily illuminating, I can write about whatever you were saying, like moving to the country, and like I could write about anything in my life. 
Like one thing I wrote about was being a kid in England in the 1970s, and then like I met this guy in um, the Tate Museum, and he was following me around, and well, he looked sort of like Andy Warhol, who I didn't know then, but like um, he started following me around, and then he said to me, well, uh, it turned out he was American, came from Neptune, New Jersey, do you want to uh, come to my house and have dinner with me and my wife? So I said, sure. So I went to his house, and then they said, now we're going to play strip poker. And so the deal was, like, you had to do what was told to you after you played strip poker, but I wasn't going to take my clothes off, which sort of wrecked the strip poker. <laughs> then they said, okay, anyway, a few things happened, which is in the book, and then they said, now come with us to a party. So we took many, many subways and taxis way, way out, and I don't know where the hell it was, it was London, 1976, and there was a party at this guy's loft, Andrew Logan, and then um, I was like 18 years old, and then uh, uh, there was all these people at this party, and then all of a sudden a little band got up on stage and started playing, and I was like, what the hell, this is, they're, they're really bad, this is terrible. And this guy was standing next to me, and you know, the English in those days dressed fabulously. They dressed so differently than anybody else in the rest of the world. He was wearing a very beautifully best spoke suit with um, polka dots. And so I'm like, my God, this is a terrible win. He's like, yeah, I know, but they're so bad, they're going to be world famous. And so they played three songs, and then they got off the stage. By then, I was sitting in the other room looking sulky because the band was so bad, but I looked like like um, an angry punk, which was the beginning of the punk movement. So the band came in, and the photographers gathered around and started to take my picture with this band, and uh, it was the Sex Pistols. <laughs> so I was like at the second concert of the Sex Pistols. So I just, I kept having adventures all my life, and I had a lot more adventures than what are in the book, but whatever adventures I wanted to remember, I put in this book. <laughs> Sorry, I did not answer about nature. <laughs> I think you did, and I want to love something as much as I lo as you love your shrub. I just I want to feel that, um, and yeah. Um, but the, you so in the book you talk a lot, a lot about these amazing adventures and and people you have run with. It's the Sex Pistols, it's Andy Warhol, it's it's all of these different people. Has fame changed uh, in in the time since you uh, wrote that? What is, does fame mean? A different thing. I, I don't know what fame means. Like I. I mean, I've known Vincent and Shelley here, and um, Vincent was Andy Warhol's right-hand man, and I've known them since as long as I've been in New York. Um, fame meant, like, I was just writing these stories about going to art openings in downtown New York, and then all of a sudden, uh, I was in New York less than four years, and I was on the cover of New York Magazine, and I didn't know what the heck was happening. And, you know, New York just um, takes people that are successful, that represent the city, and it, it basically chews off their legs. They just, they don't like you having a success in New York. They like it just for one second, and then who does she think she is? And as Vincent can attest to, um, Andy Warhol was so, so famous in his lifetime, um, but they he was very much maligned. Uh, the critics did not care for him. Uh, he didn't have a gallery in New York in his lifetime. He just went on, and he was very um, loved in many ways. Construction workers, he had done a Pontiac commercial, construction workers would be like, yo, Andy, he, you know, he was, he was part of the city, but until his death, he wasn't ever really given credit or accolades the way he was following his death. And I'm not saying I should have been given credits or accolades, I'm just saying if you get a little bit famous, like I was on the cover of New York Magazine, then all of a sudden it's like, who does she think she is? But, but I didn't think I was anybody, you know? Well, there's, there's this notion that fame comes with money, and you talk a lot in the book about how that is not necessarily true. So uh, can we talk a little bit about that? Because financial anxiety runs uh, throughout in, in, a, in a really pretty solid way. I don't know, like, I mean, I know some of you are writers, and Vince, you're a really fabulous writer, but I know that unless, for most American writers in this country, if they're not teaching at a university, very few of them make a living off of their writing. And I mean, maybe um, Stephen King, Daniel Steele, a handful of writers are really able to make a living from, from writing. For the most part, people aren't really reading that much. And if you go downstairs, you can find books for $2. I would rather have the $2 book than pay out the 30 bucks for a new book, you know? I mean, my odds of it being anything decent or readable are just as good. <laughs> 
Yeah, and everybody should buy the book. Buy the book. Too. <laughs> buy the book and buy her lots of champagne and meals and treat her like the fabulous, treat her the fabulous life that she deserves. Because um, in the book, there's there's a lot of you putting yourself out for your parents in a pretty extraordinary way. And uh, I mean, I the thing that kept hitting me in the heart about this book is the contrast between these adventures you had and then the reality of having to, you know, clean up your mother when she had soiled herself. And, you know, I'm sure that that had to be a tremendous, you know, emotional and cultural shock for you to have to deal with. So can you talk about that a little bit? Um, like, I was really lucky because my mother was always my best friend and my main supporter. She never had any money. And um, she, like, was fired. She was a dietitian when she got married to my father. Back then, women got fired as soon as they got pregnant. There was no other jobs for women. Uh, there was no careers, you know, things have changed so much for women. I do worry about young women who really don't understand the history of women in the 20th century and um, how uh, difficult things were before birth control. You, you had to stay virgin. First of all, you were considered soiled. And soiled. If you weren't a virgin, you could get pregnant and you couldn't have an abortion. You could have a baby out of wedlock. Your life was wrecked, you know. Things have changed. There was no jobs for women, really. Uh, my aunt was uh, got a... PhD in economy, and she could get a job as an as an uh, secretary for an economist. I mean, lives for women have changed so so much. My mother went back to school and uh, began writing poetry and got her MFA, and finally, at the age of 50, got a job at Cornell. And by the time she retired, she was a professor at Cornell. But um, uh, uh, the main thing was, I think, why I became a writer is that my mom was so supportive of me, not financially, but just psychologically. She never said to me, you know, you should get a job as a lawyer, um, uh, you should get married. She was just like, look, I'm not even going to say you're a great writer. She's just like, this novel starts at page 30. That's where it really takes off. Keep going. You have talent. If this is what you want to do, I'm 100% behind you. And all I can offer you is my extra spare bedroom if you bail out and need a place to live. So to me, that was huge support. She was reading my books. She had great critical acumen. We grew up together reading book after book after book. We talked about the books. Um, I think uh, my book also like talks about um, meeting Lawrence Durrell in the south of France. Like he said to me, his mother was the person that said, keep, that, keep at it, keep at it. It doesn't matter whether it's your father or your mother. You have to have somebody in this world that really believes in you and supports you, I, I think, to, to be able to survive in a art thing. Yeah, and you uh, you talk in there also a lot about the sort of the very complicated man that your your father was as well. When when I grew up, it was the 1960s in a small town in western Massachusetts, Amherst, Massachusetts, and then the 60s sort of trickled down from San Francisco. So my dad started smoking pot. And the thing is, like since I was eight years old, I've never seen my father when he's not stoned out of his mind. Now I'm not going to tell you my age, but that was a long time ago. And the thing is, like marijuana, great, it should be legalized. What the hell? But I don't think it's been mentioned about long-term marijuana substance abuse at all. I think it really alters people's personality. And I also think um, there's been very little scientific research done on marijuana, what its real effects are. People say, oh, smoking it, I feel so much better, blah, blah, blah. There's not really been any scientific research done on it. But long-term marijuana effects are tremendously um, transforming, no, no more or less than, than alcoholism is. So in my opinion, Mm. Having a dad who was a big pothead from the 60s to now is quite a unique perspective into what that particular drug can can do to somebody. And um, um, I don't know. The guy's nuts. <laughs> well, it, it definitely felt like you were trying to very much protect your daughter from that. Like, yeah, and like my, we'd go up there, my dad was high all the time, and you know, the marijuana got stronger and stronger since I was little before it was just like this joint, and then it got really strong, and people were really br br um, uh, breeding t strong types of marijuana. And then my dad would be like, yeah, my friend came over last night, and I gave him a toke, and he fell over backwards in an epileptic seizure. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, that's really funny. I mean, like... So, like, uh, then I, I would go up there with my husband, and my husband would be saying to him, look, Julian, please don't smoke around the kid. Like, duh, but who, I mean, that didn't, I don't care, smoke around the kid, but 
just don't try to get her high. On the other hand, I knew what was going to happen, and um, I knew because it had happened to me. And sure enough, my dad was always on my kid's case when nobody was around. Get that kid high, get that kid high. Same as with me. Boy, took me and my kid one time each. After that, I never smoked marijuana again. And my kid actually pretty much lost interest after that. So whatever my dad did, I can offer him as a cure. <laughs> you don't want to get high after you smoke with my dad. Uh-uh. 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 Too weird. <laughs> really weird. It's another planet that guy goes on when he gets high. It's another planet. Well, at one point, you know, it would have been somewhat taboo to sit here and talk about pot. Um, there's a great chapter in here where you talk about the sort of taboos that you busted, and in particular, you stood up um, at a reading and said, after I became a prostitute, I had to deal with penises of every imaginable shape and size, and you caught some heat for just using the word penis in there. Now it would be nothing. To, I just said it again. Penis. What would you have to... Do See, you find I always are remember shockable? that story. That, like, I like, wrote the story... Um, um, I think it's the first story in Slaves of New York, and it was about a prostitute, and I'm like, well, what's the main thing a prostitute has to work with? It's, it's going to be a penis. So I wrote this story, and um, then uh, like, I really had a hard time placing this story, and um, finally it was in the early 80s. I think I wrote that story in 79, and um, I showed it to my mom. And it wasn't like, oh, my God, my daughter wrote a story about a penis. You know, It was just like, oh, okay, well, this is a pretty good story. So then I published the story, and it was in a small literary magazine. Then um, finally... I'm asked to go and give a reading at Symphony Space, and I'm like, and this was still the early 80s, and I didn't want to stand up in public. The president hadn't yet come out with the fact that he had a penis. He was still in the closet about the penis. He, it was like pre-Monica Lewinsky, you know what I mean? Like nobody had a vagina, nobody had a penis. Only thing women had was like, they had breasts, because we had J.P. Don Levy, and we had Philip Roth, and we knew women had breasts, but the other parts of the anatomy didn't exist. So, like, here I am, I'm really young, and I've written this story with penis in the front sentence, and, like, uh, the whole trip, uh, finally, I'm invited to read at Symphony Space. I had one story published in The New Yorker, and I'm going up there, like, Please, Tama, please don't make me read that story about the penis. Oh, Tama, you're going to read that story about the penis. It's like, wait a minute. Who's the sadist and who's the masochist? I'm both in the same body. <laughs> so I get up to Symphony Space, and I mean, the other people read and read. I think I was like third on the list, and by then the audience is tired, and I'm like, no. You see, that word was completely taboo. So I get up at Symphony Space, and I like, after I became a prostitute, I had to deal with penises of every imaginable shape and size. So the first, like, there's dead silence in the audience, and then, like, somebody, like, ah, and then all of a sudden, like, everybody breaks out laughing. And at that point, it was like, oh, my God, I, like, shook up this sleepy audience, and it was just unbelievable. But it was one of the major humiliating experiences of my life that nobody would have to have now because we can all say penis and vagina. <laughs> and we thank you all for that. <laughs> and um, in addition to penises in the book, there is also a lot of animals. And I'm, I was so touched by your relationships with your dogs, of which at one point you had eight poodles, and your fantastic horse. Um, how did you go from like the zoo that is New York City to communing with these animals in a really deep and wonderful way? I, I don't know. I, I just don't know. I mean... I find, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. I, I started riding when I was up there. I started horseback riding because I was just going to visit my mom every day in the nursing home and I thought I gotta do something. And I would just started to take some riding lessons. I had ridden a tiny bit as a kid and then, and then I would get on this horse and I would be like, oh my God, this is a nightmare. Get me off this horse. And I was just like so scared of it. And like, these are large animals, you know what I mean? They weigh a thousand pounds and you're sitting on their back and they're like, you stupid idiot. And uh, it's not very easy to ride at all. But anyway, I just stuck it out and then all of a sudden I got addicted. So that's, that's, been, that's been fun for me at this part of my life. Now, I couldn't really move back here because it's just not set up for horseback riding. <laughs> I ride out, I'm like on the Finger Lakes now, and um, it's fantastically beautiful at this time of year, but um, from November until May, it will be hideous, and it's gray and rainy and muddy, and it's absolutely 
unlivable. We have restaurants in Schuyler County. They consist of Wendy's, Domino's, and a pizza parlor. And we have Walmart up there where I like go in there and you go in winter, everybody's got cabin fever. You see a man, he's like 70 years old, looks okay, dressed in the farmer's outfit. You're waiting on the checkout line, he turns and spits on the ground. <laughs> like, whoa, we're in Walmarts and you're just spitting on the ground. I mean, this is amazing place up there, but during the warm, nice months, most of the time too, it's hunting season up there. You, you can't like ride with any security or safety. Um, these hunters, they're, they're, it's like a big hunting area. And, uh, but when it's nice like this, I take my pony and I just ride. I just go out there and I go through the 16,000 acres or whatever it is of the Finger Lakes National Forest. It's fabulously beautiful, but Schuyler County, as I say, is a depressed area. And um, Tompkins County, the nearby area, it's like we're banning plastic bags. There's no more plastic bags in Tompkins County. Schuyler County, it's like hey, let's get rid of our old bathtub. We're going to get a new bathtub. Well, okay, what should we do with the old bathtub? Throw it in the woods. <laughs> so I can always, I can always, on the horse, find my way back through the Finger Lakes Forest because you just have to remember where the old bathtubs <laughs> have been left along the way. And you and I have both had our personal space invaded by squirrels. Uh, a squirrel broke into my house once and ate all my tortilla chips and just stood there taunting me. <laughs> and I know that a squirrel um, abused your personal space as well. Yeah, I've had, I've had abuse. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, <laughs> I don't know. I, it seems specifically it had defecated on your manuscript at some point. All right, all right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they are, they are pretty much just Satan of, of the woods so far as I'm concerned. No, I became a, when I moved up there, I became a licensed wildlife animal rehabilitator. You have to take a quest, question pass test. It's a lot of technical stuff. I don't know, I was trying to get my kid into college, so I said, like, kid, take the test, study, we'll study the book together, and you'll become a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. That'll get you into college. So we get the book a week before um, the test. You gotta go and take this test, and you'll become a licensed wildlife animal rehabilitator if you get 80 out of 100 points. So we're studying the test. There's a lot of hard questions, like if you find a baby fox, is a vet allowed to administer live rabies vaccine? No. A vet cannot administer live rabies vaccine. Um, if you have an animal and it's this ra raccoon and it defecates, how do you um, get rid of the uh, uh, feces? Can you bury it? No. Can you put it in the garbage? No, you must use a blowtorch on the raccoon's feces. So um, then I, uh, my kid got to be, we, we passed like within one point of, of passing. So we're like the world's worst <laughs> licensed animal rehabilitator. So meanwhile, like the kid's like, mom, please get me off this list. I can't get any more of these phone calls from the people finding like baby squirrels and stuff. <laughs> So, like, I'm still at it, right? And my house is invaded by mice. So I'm putting out the traps and the poison because I don't want the vermin in my house. Then I get the phone call. Um, hi, I got your number from Cornell University. You're a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. I found a baby mouse. <laughs> I put it in the bathtub, and now I've got it in a cage, and it's out on my porch. What, how do I raise this mouse? Like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, lady. Lady, you don't want the vermin in your house. You know what I mean? Like... <laughs> Like, you can't be a wildlife licensed rehabilitator with, with, a, with an attitude like that. That's a bad, <laughs> bad attitude. <laughs> so what is, what is the thing that you hope people most take away from reading this, this book of your f fantastic, amazing life? I, I don't know, like you either just have my sense of humor or you don't, because like I say, the woman said, mm, these memoirs, they're not illuminating and they're not insightful and they're not touching and they're not evocative and they're not all the things the memoirs are supposed to be. But you know what? Like, it's just a book. <laughs> <laughs> like, just like, you just want to read a book and be somewhat entertained for a little bit and, and that's it really.
That's it. And I promise all of you are going to be incredibly entertained by this. And I'm thinking, are you ready for some questions from the lovely people out here? No one's ever ready, really. No, I thank you all so much for coming and everything. And um, Questions? Anyone? Yeah. I, um, I wanted to ask you about the aims of the decade because on the years I was in high school, and I always saw as a kind of unique creative moment, like there was all these musical artists who got their start there, like Madonna, Prince, Boy George. It was just a time of incredible change. And people make fun of it now. I'm like, there's something to make fun of. Incredible things got started with the computer and different things and, you know, the new age music movement. I think you typify that because you kind of evoked the whole spirit of that decade. It wasn't the 60s, you know, it was like a time when things were solidifying, but there was still a lot of artistic ferment. And I was wondering, when you look back in the 80s, do you think of it as, as this transformative time? Do you think it was just another decade? Like, you see it somewhere between that. The question is, was the 80s, a, do I look back on it as a transformative time? And the thing is, me, I don't think any of us really thought that much at the 80s when it was happening. I was there and thinking like, whoa, how come I didn't get to be through the 1960s? That was a really cool time. And then like the 80s were there and we were just running around New York and yeah, there was a lot of fun stuff going on, but I just kept thinking, it's so lame. I didn't think 30 years later people would be like, well, well you were there in the 80s. That's amazing, like the 80s. I just, I didn't think anything at the time. I'm still not thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Will you write more fiction? Uh, the question, will I write more fiction? I've just, I just finished a novel, a rough draft of a novel, and um, my fabulous agent, Christopher Schelling, is here, and he's going to help me fix it up. And um, it's been hard for me because always before my mom as I said, would, would read my drafts when I would get stuck, and I would get stuck, and then she would say, well, this book takes off at page 30, keep going, and, you know, so it's been really hard for me. But thank goodness I have Christopher who's encouraging me and is helping me shape it. Anyway, I want to I wanna say thank you all so much for, for coming here. Hey, yeah, thank you so much, I believe.